Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being patient. After that break, we had a remake, and we've got a stand-in. Oh, blow your brains. About to blow out his internet as he couldn't get it back. And now we've got Nubik, a face we may recognize, standing in for Moscow 5. I'm Zayori, joined again by Blaze. And Blaze, what's up, dude? Not too much. Looking at this game here, it just gets better and better as we add some instability to it. But, you know, Nubik jumping in, a, a fresh face in, in this regard. Uh, Moscow 5, I think, has run him a couple of times this stand in, but otherwise, we know him uh, professionally. And we're going to see what he can pull out. Obviously, PGG is probably going to look to go for the guaranteed stun support. Uh, so, Ventral Spirit probably going to be picked up by him. I'm curious if uh, we're going to see, like, Nubik Ogre or we're going to see a little bit of roll swap. What they're really going to do with this stand, it's kind of uh, spur of the moment with uh, the fact that not only are there issues with uh, the reconnect there, and then obviously with BYB not able to get back online. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things about finding this stand in here was that as soon as we determined, all right, PGG, you got to find a stand in, almost instantly, five people joined the game. <laughs> And it was a matter of, like, picking and choosing, and he picked one, then someone else joins, he goes, okay, no, you. Oh, wait, no, 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 wait, wait, actually, no, actually, Nubik is who I wanted. Sorry, Garter, see you later. It's just like, damn, PGG's got, like, this whole, I, I just picture, like, this herd of people following him. He's the leader. It's the PGG and, posse, man. Yeah, dude. There, there you go. The PGG posse. I like that. Um, <laughs> so, we'll see. The draft looking pretty similar to how it started. It was supposed to be a redraft of the same opening. So DP Ogre for M5, and the Skywrath Void Centaur is what the Balkan Bears had picked up. And this is mm -hmm. when we got into our randoms where we saw the Bat Rider and the Omni Knight, uh, and they won't be here. So sky's the limit. Balkan Bears, they'll need their second support and their position one. And uh, we'll see what they want to do as they do start to dip into some of that bonus time. Now, as far as the PGG posse goes, you have to consider how many re-retries we've seen. How many iterations of that team have come out and how many people he swapped in and out of that team. I don't think there's half the CIS scene that hasn't played with PGG on a professional team at some point. The amount of times he swapped around. So That's it's, a good point. It almost comes as no surprise. That's a very good point. There have been a lot of retries. And I'm just making sure there's no, uh, no DCs here as BBC really taking their time. Um, who would be good with the Skywrath Mage? They've got a good zoning support. I think the Sand King is kind of a, a natural choice with this kind of a lineup. Great synergy with the uh, Chronosphere. Dump in some of that. Boom Boom Pow, Epicenter, and uh, Skywrath Mage can zone out in the lane while all Sand King can roam around a little bit, stack up, and, and work that jungle. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in that, so we'll see if they go with that. Earthshaker's going to be the follow-through instead, and okay. uh, I mean, no matter what they go, they have a lot of disable right now. Chronosphere, the hoof stomp, four, three stuns from the Earthshaker, and uh, yeah, a lot of magic damage flying out. But I think they do need to emphasize a little bit more uh, against BKB-type targeting. They need to go for something that's more physically oriented. I mean, Faces Void is okay, but they can certainly do better. So here, they're going for the last pick, their solo mid, and I definitely think it has to be something that emphasizes physical damage a little bit more. Um, the Viper was banned out, the Razor as well, so those aren't going to be really great, easy options. But, I mean, I don't know. I, I could see something... We were talking about this before. What goes well against a Death Prophet in the mid lane? And if it's not a dual lane, then it, it's, it's going to be a tough sell no matter what. But that, I definitely think it's something that needs to be emphasizing if the cores of Moscow 5 pick up BKBs, that they'll still be able to survive. Yeah, I think you're right. The easiest way to deal with the Death Prophet, honestly, is just rotating. Uh, mm -hmm. Grabbing somebody who's just a solid laner and um, having some rotations come out. I suppose it could be a core shaker. We have seen that at sort of an increasing frequency sure. lately. I saw one yesterday... Who did we see do the core shaker yesterday? I was casting with Purge, and I've totally forgotten which match it was. It was against BBC, I think. Hmm. Who did they yeah, play? Yeah, I yesterday? remember. I remember just skimming that one. I saw about five to ten minutes there, but I could could not recall exactly who it was running on the air shaker at the time. Anywho, we've got a fun little one here. Medusa coming out. 
and pretty well perfectly set up for it at this position. They were just kind of weighing their options, making sure she wouldn't be too heavily punished by what BBC have brought to bear so far. But if you look at what Moscow 5 have put on the table already, she's pretty much in a perfect position right here. Vengeful Spirit to enhance her damage, negate the armor of her opponents, Ogre Magi to provide the bloodlust and also the early game presence to get her off the ground. And then Death Prophet, obviously we know the synchronization with her ultimate and the Dusas, the Stone Gaze plus the Exorcism, there's going to be a lot of pain going to those petrified targets. Oh, yeah, the pain train will be coming in full force here, Blaze. And I, I know how much you just like Dusa in general, and I'm, I'm becoming a believer. Uh, it was KPG that did the Core Shaker the other day. Purge was very impressed with the offlane Dusa that Gorek ran. Yeah. Now it's all coming back to me. So Yeah, Anti-Mage plus Medusa, that is a hell of a combo there. That, that one I would recommend. But. Yeah, that was something. Hey, man, it worked out. We saw the, the Anti-Mage go Vanguard first into Crimson Guard. Same kind of a deal, and he was just punching them Rocky style left and right. And uh, opened up some space for the Medusa, and he was, like, top in the net worth chart, even though he didn't have any farm accelerators. No Midas, no Battle Fury. He was literally farming heroes. And yeah. uh, not a strategy you can rely on, I'd say, but it's still awesome when people do it and it works. Well, when the games go longer in particular, like, you don't necessarily need farm accelerators. I've been talking a lot about how this isn't really a patch for Hand of Midas very much, because the net worth is as much of a weak point that your enemy can benefit from as it is a benefit to you. I mean, I'm not saying that they should never buy it, but I'm saying that it should be underemphasized by comparison to the previous patch. And I think that, in general, if you're picking up more core heroes, all you have to do is delay the game. I mean, that seems like the most generic Mont note statement, just if you have carries... <laughs> Make the ga game go as long as possible. But in 6.82, like, you can actually... I've seen interviews with Black in particular who mentioned you go, in this metagame, two significant core heroes and then a really hard carry on top of that. Seems greedy, but as long as you turtle long enough, it's going to pay off. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of the, the glory of Mott Notes, Blaze. That is something I had forgotten about, and I'm, I'm glad to have that revitalized in my, my uh, random access memory here. Lycan! For BBC, Big Wolfie, we've seen him kind of intermittently uh, to mixed results. He got pretty pretty bashed upside the head with the nerf stick this patch, I, I have to admit. He still is that strong rat Dota hero, can chuck through those towers in the lanes, but here we will actually see the bat, bat Rider, as uh, luck be have it, one of the randoms that Moscow 5 had uh, before we had this remake. So that'll be your Tron hero headed to the offlane. Nice, well-rounded draft for M5, but... A Weeha Lycan. Now, this is a new one across his uh, broad array of core heroes we've seen: the Meepo, the Invoker, the Light, or the uh, the the Life Stealer. That's it, and the Slark. Now we're gonna get to see him play Lycan. Any thoughts about that player hero matchup here, Blazy? I mean, he definitely is a very skilled player. He likes to make his actions happen and speak for themselves. So when you're knocking down towers, when you're controlling the lane, when you're taking objectives like Roshan, you're definitely going to be the person in the spotlight. And that works very well for a pub mentality there. But we'll see. I think he still needs a lot of help from his uh, supports as far as rotations go. He's going for a mid Lycan versus a Death Prophet. And while that's manageable, it's not ideal. And I definitely think that he's going to need some help. So we'll see how often the... Shaker as well as the Skyrath rotate to his aid, but I definitely think that it, it could work very well if uh, he has the right mentality going to it, and specifically if he's practiced in 6.82, because it's honestly a very, very different hero with the shapeshift time and uh, just yeah. all those all other little changes there. But if I have to call a, a draft victory, even though I like Lycan to an extent, I think that with that last pick, Batrider, that uh, Moscow 5 just have the far better lineup. They, d they don't even have to over-execute to make this lineup work for them. A simple lasso into Stone Gaze, and that guarantees them a fight with or without Stampede. Yeah, definitely. Some initial wards have come down. Dyer get a, a ward on the other side of the tree line, so this will be a slightly easier time for Padrino here in the off lane. And uh, Radiant Observers will get one on the bottom rune and one right outside of range of the top rune, but on this entryway into the Dyer jungle, that second Dyer Observer. Gets cover of the top rune and uh, a little bit into the lane here on the high ground right outside this cliff. Tron will grab the bounty rune and down bottom McGee. He'll find himself into a regeneration. Not going to be so useful for uh, old PGG there. But I do like these cosmetics from Weeha. He's going to keep it cool and simple. The common belt and the best hairdo in the game, the comb of the great gray. <laughs> old man lichen. Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah. So let's introduce some rosters here, Blaze, and oh, PGG, he's going to get aggressive here. He's on the Ogre, he'll be roaming around a little bit. It is essentially a safe lane try. Stand in Nubik on the position one, Dusa, King R 
on the Vengeful Spirit. Tratata, a.k.a. Vigas here on the Death Prophet mid. And that puts Tron in the offlane Batrider. And PGG with boots first. Hasn't skilled up anything yet, but boy, do they want to pressure this Lycan early on as Tratata softening him up here with some Crypt Swarm, some auto attacks, and already Weeha getting pretty low. He only has two pulled tangos, so right now he's out of regeneration for the next 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. The thing that stands out to me here is that King R didn't go for a stack at this point in time. There are some here uh, players that think that on the Radiant side you can actually just focus on triangle pulling, and that means you don't have to return to your pull camp until the, the 1 minute 13 mark and then go for the triangle. But uh, with these heal trolls, oh, actually, mid lane. Shoot, first yeah. blood blaze, and I forgot to unmute the sounds. That was very lackluster. Sorry about that, folks. But first blood comes out. PGG, his patience pays off as they finish off the Lycan. Thought they may go for a courier snipe, but uh, the bamboo panda does live, and uh, instead they settle for the first blood. PGG gets credit for it, and that's a lot of bonus gold coming out on McGee. Mm-hmm. Yep, they're gonna, it looks like they're going to try to chain up the pull here. It should be successful. It's really annoying with these heal trolls to make it happen, but now Padrino won't be able to mess it up. We'll take some pot shots of his own. They will follow up with a magic missile, and they do have to have probably the Fisher to bail him out. So, yeah, Levi will pop that one, and they will be able to get out. But, yeah, it's some major damage coming out for Padrino, and it's kind of forcing Levi to stay down here. And generally speaking, even as a bat rider who can firefly over Fisher, you're pretty happy when one support is completely on the other side of the map in your off-landing circumstances. Yeah, so please, is it actually Levi or is it Levi? I've, I've said both, though I've been um, going His going icon Levi. is from Shingeki no Kyojin, aka Attack on Titan, so I think it's emulating that character, and it is okay. pronounced Levi in Japanese. Levi, all right, I'm going to Levi. I'm going to switch it up, I like that. Uh, so we've got Levi there on the Earthshaker, Padrino on the offlane Centaur, no surprise. We've seen Weeha on his Lycan, the victim of the first blood. And up top, it'll be Haki on the uh, Faceless Void here, farming in the safe lane. In Solitude, he'll take the Skywrath Mage. 2-1-2 two, two, coming out for the Balkan Bears. And M5 will stay steady with their pseudo tri lane here. As PGG, he's just been roaming, a, roaming like crazy, and uh, he's picked up a smoke now. Yeah, he roamed to the Tier 2 tower. He just TP to the Tier 2 to get this stack off. I, that's 100 gold right there. Like, I guess you get some more value invested in Vigos's Death Prophet. That's pretty nice, but it just it's very, very weird to see a Tier 2 TP for anything other than, like, the, the most discreet of ganks. But, yeah, Gigi level Dota. 1 Ogre. Jumping from Fountain to the front lines. <laughs> it is kind of an awkward movement. You do make a, a good point here, but... Safe Lane Farmer is off to a great start. Stand in Nubik on the Dusa, racking up the last hits. Number one on the chart. Uh, kind of going blow for blow with the Void. Tron has found his level three in the Radiant off lane. Padrino, soon to be level three, so fairly comparable there. Neither of them farming particularly well. Just a handful of last hits. Uh, the disparity is that mid lane where DP and Lycan farming somewhat evenly, but that first blood does tip the scales just a little bit. And I guess of all the times for Weeha to die, it didn't hurt too much. Didn't really have so much unreliable gold stored up as he had just picked up his bottle, which was on the way. So he's he's starting to recover a little bit, and they may want to try to put a little more pressure on him and perhaps gank him again if they really want to slow him down. Will be a battle for the rune spawn here at the four-minute mark. Padrino and Levi leave the lane. Yes. Bounty rune gets picked up by the Earth Shaker. Padrino takes a stun, but there's your fissure. Centaur with the hoof stomp. King R could find himself in some trouble, but in comes PGG. He's got an ignite. That'll slow down the Centaur, and now King R will take this long path back to the lane. He's thinking about turning Wave of Terror onto Padrino. PGG wants this. An auto attack more from McGee might be enough to bring him down, but no, Ventral Spirit goes off to the Earthshaker, and Padrino will suicide into the Ancient. So a one-for-one death-wise, but of course it is BBC that come out ahead as they do not give away any of that valuable experience. Yep, nice little aggressive play there. Holding on to the double edge. It was only level one, so unless you're getting the killing blow with that, you don't want to pop it. We do see him TPing right into a creep wave, though, and a Medusa. He was willing to throw a couple of paw shots his way, and he only has the one tango. So without Tranquil Boots here, he actually might have a hard time just going for the 1v1 matchup. But at least for now, we're going to be seeing uh, just the kind of stagnation occur. The Void wants to wait to Chrono until he's actually going to make some things happen. And Weeha on the mid lane is actually really suppressed. This poor little Captain Bamboo Courier, he was hobbling around at like 280 movement speed when he was on the ground. Now he's got some wings underneath him, but even still, he's been bottle crowing all day long, and it, it's got to be frustrating for the little guy. It's a tough life for a panda. A life of servitude, and, uh, well, hopefully they feed him well in terms of bamboo. But I'm not really sure if bamboo grows on this map. I've never really seen any. Oh, boy. Well, 
the mid lane disparity continues to grow as now DP just pulling way ahead. She's found her level 6. An interesting play from Vigos to grab the Exorcism at level 6. This is sort of a rarity these days. You'll almost always see Death Prophets hold it till level 8, max out the Witchcraft, hold Crypt Swarm at level 3, and then get the Exorcism once you have all those extra ghosts. Uh, often because you don't really have a huge opportunity to use the ultimate this early on either. The mid laners usually don't oh. roam around that much, but... Rotation, Weeha uses the ultimate, gets the channel off to the side, but the Fissure doesn't actually stun, nor yeah. block out. Levi, oh, that could have been a kill, but he whiffs it. Nah, the, the shapeshift popping there, I mean, even if it was in the Fog of War, him coming out like that showed very quickly what their intentions were, and Levi just wasn't in the position to get it. If they were a little bit further forward when they did that, I, they definitely would have had a guaranteed kill there, but... They just, they gave up the ghost a little bit too early, and yeah, we'll see. Death Prophet skirting away. I've seen the Vigas go for this build pretty much every time since 6.82, really? and I think it has a, a lot to do with his rune control. The fact that he's very confident in his ability to continuously infuse his bottle with that restoration, keep the mana flowing, and as a result, make a, a cool play with the surprising early exorcism. But he is going for a very inefficient build here, 4 0 2 one really has to get a full recharge and still have a rune on top if he's going to make the most of those abilities. Mm. Okay, interesting. You guys doing stuff a little differently, but uh, Tron, he's made some decent recovery relative to the Centaur. He's rotated into the jungle. Looks like he took out that double stack from PGG earlier, and sharing is caring as they'll stack up. Uh, Tron will miss his, but don't worry. PGG was on point, and now he's got a big double stack here, so... Well on his way to a decently timed Blink Dagger, 1300 gold on Tranquils, already level 6 at the 7 minute mark. He's in great shape. Uh, Centaur, on the other hand, he's still in Strug City. He's trying to find his Tranquils and has not even started the grind towards his Blink Dagger. Yeah, so I mean, he's very, very slow at this point. No Tranquil Boots, he has a hard time jungling in general, and yeah, he's just going to be going and clearing out the smallest satyrs he can because he can maximize the AoE damage he deals with Double Edge in return. But we do see on the mid lane, PGG is going to be going down. Just the, mostly the Wolf right clicks with the help of Levi's stun, but we do see Weeha will take a lot of damage and just barely bottle through on the tail end of that. That was a close one. 20 hit points remaining there as well. Oh, Pedrino going to have a little DC issue here and give us a moment to think about what's going on. Haki has been left alone, and that is one of the things about the Batrider moving to the jungle. Sure, he's found a lot of farm, but now the Faceless Void, uh, almost level 8, has Power Treads going into the more aggressive Mask of Madness rush. No farm accelerator, but we'll be looking to move around the map and find some potential kills. But the big problem in terms of the BBC strategy is that no one's stopping Nubik from farming either. And uh, Batrider jungles a lot more effectively than Old Centaur. It's about a thousand golden experience lead for Moscow 5, and... Even just the superior farm in the mid lane of Death Prophet. Sure, PGG taking a death there will help out Weeha a bit, but DP still just getting significantly better uh, farm in terms of last hits. Yeah, and I don't think you can expect much more out of the lane than that. If the Skyrath hasn't left the top lane this entire time, that's what's going to happen. The bottom line is Death Prophet will just dominate that position. So, yeah, we do see that she's going to be able to get more out of it, especially once uh, the Lycan leaves the lane. He's a hero that loves to go for the jungle or Roshan in the earlier stages of the game, and that's going to be a free tier 1 tower for Vigos at the very least. And honestly, it also leaves them some room to contest yes. if they do have a good scouting and such. But at least for now, the Skyrath is making his move somewhere else. Solitude finds his way down bottom, and he does have the backup of the Earthshaker there. Yeah, see if they can put some pressure on the Dusa. Uh, we'll see what build Nubik ends up going for. He's pulling up a lot of gold. You'll almost always see... Ooh, mid lane. We'll see a little bit of action back and forth. Nope, never mind. Just a Crypt Swarm chunking him down. But uh, normally you'll see that Aquila come out pretty early on. A pretty core item on Dusa, but he's pulling up that gold, making me think he might just rush the Lincolns off the Wraith Band, given that he's had so much space to farm. Could also be considering a Hand of Midas. Uh, at this rate, he's had so much farm. Could grab it at the 9-minute mark and uh, would be very well-timed. So a lot of options here for Nubik. Be interested to see where he goes. Yeah, yeah, really curious myself. I mean, we've seen Blink Dusas and weird stuff like that too, but you're probably running Lincoln's Fear. We actually see a mid lane here. It's going to be some pressure onto Tron, but they are going to get the Fisher to start off. Chain Stun means Batrider is definitely going down, and uh, Crypt Swarm is almost going to be enough to bring down Weeha, but Vigas can't get in right click range. He's just going to Sav away. Another nice Crypt Swarm attempt. Oh, it does connect, but the Sav is enough. 15 oh, HP remain. This guy, that's three times now. He survived with like less than 20 HP and just kind of, okay, guys, I'm headed back to the well. That was a close one. Holy Toledo.
Either Weeha is getting very lucky, or this guy really knows his limits better <laughs> than anyone I've seen recently. Cheese and crackers. Yeah, so a lot of close calls, but yeah, in the end, he's just kind of knocked back a couple of times, using the courier a lot of times for bottle crowing, going back to the fountain. It's not kills, so it's not the biggest losses, but it's still good damage coming out from Vigos, who has sustained his mana pool quite substantially. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is the ability of Nubik to go for the straight-up Lincoln's Rush, as we see here, is completely based on how little pressure has been put out on him. At the very least, Medusa should be buying a Magic Wand based on the pressure you put out on her because of the efficiency charges give from mana and HP. I know Purge was talking about that last time around as well. But, yeah, yeah Matt, I mean, if he's not even having to go for a Magic Wand, you know this Medusa's had a great laning phase. Like, that's essentially like having a Midas on your Medusa. But we see Haki going for some damage onto PGG, and, yeah, there's not much you can do in that situation. Yep, Ogre may be tanky, but can't uh, can't really survive that, especially once the Mask of Madness comes out on Void at the 10 minute mark. This is uh, one, maybe one of the first peaks for Void where he does a lot of damage. Meanwhile, on the bottom lane, Petrino stampedes forward, but Stone Gaze comes out. Don't look at her. Oh, Levi, he's turned into stone. He'll get clicked down a little bit. King R survives, at least for now. Petrino coming in. Magic Missile will have cooled down. Petrino, he gets finished off by the missile, and now he'll try to TP out, but Levi coming in. He won't be able to get it, and it'll be a close call, but she'll live. Now PGG joining the party. Levi, nowhere for him to go. Bat Rider has a lasso, doesn't even need it. Shows off that blink dagger and burns him down to the fiery depths of hell with that firefly. Get baited. That was really just an overzealous attempt by BBC there, but I figured they'd get at least something out of it. They invested a lot. In the end, they don't even get the Vengeful Spirit. Oh, that's just so painful. And yeah, it's Power Stone Gaze. You really don't get to play the fight the way you want to. We do see uh, in the mid lane here, Weeha gets a little far forward. Another disconnect coming out from the center here, but you're going to have some issues. He's in some trouble here, Blaze. Tron is on his way over. He's got a Blink Dagger mm -hmm. Lasso. Hmm. Now, it's worth noting that Shapeshift does not get canceled if you get hit by a Silence or Magic Missile after you start the spell. So if he pops a Shapeshift right now, he should be okay, but that Silence is a very quick animation, and I'm, I'm actually not sure which one wins out at the start of the Shapeshift. And Venge, well, we can't see here. Not in range for the Nether Swap, I don't think, but if he stops the shapeshift, King R is going to be able to swap him back and at least buy time for the Bat Rider to get over. We'll see how this one plays out. This could be pretty. Well, okay, maybe not. Bummer. Yeah. Come on, Pedrino, go kick the router. Yeah, having some issues there, and it's a pretty intense moment in mid. Obviously, they want the centaur in position for this, not because he can stampede or do anything about this situation, just because it's lost time on your. Your fellow there, I mean, maybe he could look to TP to the mid lane and try to make something happen with what mana pool he has left. I mean, all he needs to do is really stone and double edge. But yeah, eh, this is a tough one. Without the Yules, I don't see them getting the kill. Weeha still has enough movement speed after that shapeshift starts. But I mean, maybe uh, a perfect attempt on the silence and stun. We'll see. Okay. There's your silence. Oh, God. Hit the wrong button. Oh. And Tron, he'll blink over the tree line. Yeah, Weeha. I don't think he's going to survive this one unless it'll be another close call now. They've got the magic missile. They lock down the Lycan, and that'll make it 5-4 to four as M5 gain a lot of momentum here off this initial string of kills. Meanwhile, on the bottom lane, PGG gets stunned up by the Centaur after the stun from the Earthshaker, but Big Ogre living up to the hype and the double edge. That'll cut into that belly. They carve off a little bit of bacon, and uh, PGG will get that first-class ticket back to the grave. Yeah, committing hard for him, but that just gives space for Haki to push on the top line. Like, no ultimates up for Moscow 5 almost entirely. Like, the level 1 nether swap is not really a cooldown you worry about at this stage in the game. So here, he's just able to farm up top. They're able to get the Vlads on the Lycan, although he did just go down. He's ready to look at Roshan very shortly, and uh, now they have two things to deal with. They have to deal with the farm of the Void up on the top lane, but they also have to try to control the pit. So we already see the smoke come out, but in the wrong order. He actually smokes and then... Oh, wait, the wolves are in Visp. What am I talking about? Sometimes you see the earlier Roche plays and you have to make sure you summon and then smoke, but ah, those are the really old Lycan days, not this one. Padrino taking some hits on bottom, but it uh, looks like the TP rotation, the Chronosphere. Can they do it? The Mystic Flare, no swap! No mana for swap from King R means then Medusa will be going down. They were just not ready for that. Medusa didn't have her mana shield on. Can't toggle it inside the Chrono. If she had been a little more aware that maybe a fight might break out like that, Definitely would have toggled it on, but uh oh, we'll see another follow up here. Levi, the fire's getting put down. He uses a dunk, but doesn't really do that much. He gets uh, flame broke forward. 
still ends up going down, and it's kind of a one for one. But uh, nice rotation from BBC, catching the Deuce completely off guard. And uh oh, Wee is in the Roche pit. He's stuck. Tron, he scouted it out. Uh, or has he? Yeah, they'll move in. They see it. He'll pop his ultimate, and Big Wolfie will hightail it out of there. Uh, but Roche is very low, and there could be potential for a Roche snipe. Exorcism should be up soon. Yeah, about 20 seconds. And there's potential. Padrino, no blink dagger, not even close. He'll just have to gallop his way in. And M5 will have all five alive and start to converge around the Roche pit, where a skirmish is soon to break out here, it would seem, Blaze. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. I mean, Tron, actually, his Firefly expired on the cliff. He didn't watch the timer well enough. He looked to go in, and he actually didn't have the mana. But now we do see the lasso bring down Padrino. And without Chrono and without Stampede, there's no way they can test the pit. Yep. Roshank goes down. Weeha feels pretty bad about it. Looks to maybe kill off an Aegis with a Wolfie. But even that's hard-pressed against the Fisher here. Yep, Aegis picked up by the Ogre, actually. I think they were in sort of panic mode. Don't get denied, Aegis. Let's just pick it up. Probably not your ideal carrier, either the Dusa or the Death Prophet, a little more likely, but regardless, they secure the Roche, and I don't think M5 are really that, that worried about the Aegis. I think they're more happy just to have Roche on for themselves mm -hmm. and deny it from the Lycan more than anything else. Exactly. It's a ex golden experience asset at this stage in the game. The Aegis might come of something, but I don't think there's any hero that absolutely needs Aegis in this game. And it really comes down to just uh, making sure that it's like stealing a couple of ancient stacks there very easily. and. Uh, that just puts them in a better position to transition in the mid game. They've got, already got, like I talked about, the team fight advantage when they get the initiation, and that puts BBC in a difficult spot where they have to make every Chronosphere count. But we've seen what this Void can do. We'll see if he's actually going to... He can't TP bottom lane. This is a bad, bad fight for BBC. Centaur uses the ultimate to get things started. King Art sidesteps the uh, Mystic Flare, and now they'll go on to Padrino, takes the Magic Missile, gets hit by a Snake. Nobody likes Cobras. And Levi off to the side will stake some damage from the Ogre. Petrino tries to TP home, Flame Break to interrupt it. They'll find the kill there. Meanwhile, Levi getting chased down. Gets off a Fisher before he falls, but it's a two for nil, and now Solitude may be the next target. Lasso cooling down in just a second here. Batrider won't commit for it. Instead, PGG TP's top to repel the power of the Void, who is soon to have a Maelstrom. Actually has it coming out on the Courier right now. And the rest of M5 will stay bottom. The Glyph comes out to delay him, but they will be able to secure this Tier 1 tower off the back of that successful skirmish. The only explanation I have for that movement is either the Faces Void did not convey the fact that his TP was on cooldown for 30 seconds, so the Chronosphere might as well not exist, and, or they were really trying to create space for tower push. I mean, obviously the like of the Void, they can split push to a decent sense, especially with Void's current item set. Oh. Yeah, he gets off the shapeshift, but still the lasso comes through. Will they have the damage to bring him down? He's so damn fast, but there's your magic missile. They've got a Yules to lock him in place. PGG, he's going to come over. Nice. They've got the fire blast, and he may be fast, but can't survive the stuns. King R, the Smoke. wolves, doing a lot Smoke. of damage. Tron getting in with some body blocks, trying to bring him down. King R, he will live with some fancy footwork around the trees, and it ends up just being a freebie on the Lycan. Yeah, he's playing dancing with wolves there, quite literally, but... Uh, <laughs> The worst case scenario is that if he's if he had the clairvoyance to d use it, he could have gone for the smoke and deceit there. And since there are no heroes nearby, the the creeps would see nothing. So that would have been the the worst case scenario. Get out, get out of jail free card. But as it was, unnecessary. Just waves them down and they they get the damage they need to. Mm -hmm. Well, Nubik looks like he'll be going into a Manta, not the Lincolns first that we were thinking of. I guess it could just be a casual Yasha for now, still into Lincolns, but. Uh, has the two core pieces, a little bit suspect, hmm. and still finding a lot of space to farm. Him and Void, uh, neither of them going for a true farm accelerator. Both have had a lot of space, and they're about dead even on net worth, actually within a creep kill of each other, as Haki has completed his Maelstrom, as I mentioned before. Now level 11, the Chrono on a slightly shorter Dyer's cooldown, and it's hunting season. They've got their license to pick on the Gorgon, and Dyer's Nubik all by himself down here. He'll pick up a TP scroll. Maybe he'll TP out in time. Great map sense. They're smoked up, just realizing there's a lot missing off the map. He's the one that's all alone. He'll mm -hmm. TP to the Tier 2 tower mid, and he'll avoid the gank. Yeah, the fear is very legitimate here. The There's pressure coming in on the mid lane, but they're completely blind across the map. They have no Observer Wards in place, so even if that wasn't coming, it probably would have been a smart move no matter what, just a good general map sense. And yeah, it forces Hockey to go back to split pushing. Void does not want to be split pushing when his Chronosphere is up. He's fine with it when his... Chronos on CD, but as it stands, he hasn't gotten a kill in a very long time, and it's just CS that he's finding, which is so-so, especially when you're taking late game against Medusa. But uh, we're going to see pressure come here on mid lane, and yeah, they're in a pretty good position. I think the Manta is an okay choice here. I, I've seen a couple of professional players like Miracle, and obviously we've seen from Illidan some cool Manta dodges come out. 
and uh, fight will break out. Yeah, Haki gets caught inside of the lasso, takes a silence. The Void going down to start off this fight. Not what BBC was hoping for. The Skywrath Mage will go down also. Meanwhile, in the bottom lane, Lycan doing a bit of Rat Dota, finds a Tier 1 tower, but uh, M5 will be able to grab the Tier 1 mid, so it's a 1 for 1 tower trade, but a 2 for nil hero count and another 1,000 no gold worth of net worth going into the r Russian pockets of Moscow 5. Yeah, they're just kind of taking these fights early, making sure the Chrono doesn't come out, and yeah, this Chrono has just been offline for far too long for BBC to feel that they have any semblance of control Dyer's over the game. They need to make a big play happen, but with Stampede on cooldown, they're going to have to Dyer's go for another smoke, and that's a, a very consumable resource, as we, we see they're actually, I think, completely out, unless the Courier has some. No, the Courier Radiant's is completely out, so that means that the entire side of BBC, they, they can't resort to subtlety anymore. They have to go brute force, and mm -hmm. without the Stampede, that's something Moscow 5 can work around. Yeah, definitely. And Petrino, man, he still doesn't have this Blink Dagger, and he's not even that close. He's still 400 gold away. There's a window of opportunity still here where he could get caught out and die before he has that long-range initia uh, initiation item. We're getting close to the 20-minute mark, and... That like 10 to 20 minute window is when Centaur can really control the game with his Blink Dagger, moving around, picking up kills with the Hoof Stomp double edge combo. And by the time he gets the Blink Dagger, a lot of that power that he has has been pretty significantly diminished, especially on top of the fact that he hasn't been getting kills with the Blink, hasn't been snowballing. He's 0, 4, and 3, and is not particularly tanky given that uh, he is a Centaur after all. Dusa, uh oh, we'll hold that thought. Is mid lane, initiation going to break out perhaps? Solitude takes a Fire Blast. And he'll be all right as Crypt Swarm flies through. And now well, that'll be the end of it. But Dusa going for an interesting build here, Blaze. Mm -hmm. The ultimate orb into Point Booster. So it looks like it's a casual Yasha now right into Scotty. Yeah, yeah. This is a build that I used to love to go on Riki. Uh, well, not the phase, it was a treads instead. But you just get so much momentum off the casual Yasha. And you can go straight into the Scotty if you're just free farming. And that's what Dusa has been doing. I mean, a couple of TPs were forced out. But in general, she has just been having the run of the mill. These 20 minutes have been working out exactly as she wants them to. And it's not like the Lincolns or the Manta is going to guarantee the prevention of any of her deaths. Like, you're gonna, there's plenty of d scenarios where you're gonna die with, oh, Padrino actually going down the multicast, of course, coming up from PGG. Yeah, PGG. Yeah, he's in a good Coin spot. flip 50-50 there, he's level 11, and well, this time he'll uh, he'll flip the victory. Well done, all skill. <laughs> Definitely, and uh, yeah, with that, they just create more space, create more opportunities, but it looks like Haki at least is gonna use his Chronosphere. Finally, he can go for the Mask of Madness play onto the Ogre. Let's see if he gets a solo kill. Yep, Tubbs up here has the point booster, but yeah, not quite enough. He's going to be able to click him down. And oh! BGG actually lives. Are you kidding me? Are you jokes? Oh, oh that armor, that HP. It's got to be so damn annoying for this boy here. That point booster, that, that saved him. I love it. Meanwhile, bottom lane, fight breaks out. Weeha taking a lot of damage, but we'll be able to scoot away thanks to the stampede. Uh, Crypt Swarm won't be on the mark, but instead they'll have this exorcism with plenty of duration left and wait for this creep wave, but they should be able to push into this tier 2 tower and do a fair bit of damage. Lycan Wolves coming in, they'll scout it out, they'll start chipping away, but end of the day, not going to be able to do a hell of a lot, and this tier 2 tower without a glyph may well fall right here. Some TP reactions from BBC, Levi in the front lines, he has picked up a Blink Dagger now, but gets hit by the fire oh. for the flame break. Now Tron gets initiated on by Pedrino, showing off that blink dagger. Better late than never. Oh, Levi shit. comes in with the dunk on three. A lot of damage. Nubik has a stone gaze. He'll choose to use it here. Haki doesn't have the ultimate, but they've lost their death profit now. And looking for the stone gaze, but can't turn anyone into stone. PGG coming in. Gets a double cast or multicast on the Haki. But Nubik on the run. He gets hit by the fissure. And M5 get completely repelled by the Balkan Bears. And their tower will stay standing at least for now. Weeha, getting the Imba scout off with his wolves, had a move click command onto the Batrider to sh just reveal his position inside the Fog of War. They get the stomp, and with that, they get the kill. And uh, the team fight falls apart. This fight really hinges on Batrider starting things off by pulling in and getting essentially a 5v4 advantage because you can't fight into the Stone Gaze to try to help the lassoed ally. So generally speaking, they get the, the jump, they get the fight, but in this case, BBC strike first, and they make a very critical hold. Now in the mid lane, PGG, he's wow, getting, looking for revenge. Can he get it? The multicast is real, but a backtrack does come out. 
it's RNG versus RNG, and Haki will just barely survive. The, yeah, he gets a couple backtracks on the tail end of that dot, and uh, PGG's in a bad spot now. Oh, PGG, you will pay for your greed, good sir. He'll get chopped down, he'll get stun locked by the Blink Brothers, and that's more than enough for a kill. Meanwhile, in the Radiant Jungle, we'll see Tron in a similar situation get silenced by Solitude. He had a lasso there, he is also the gem carrier, so Tron needs to be very careful. Fissure does not stun him and he'll be able to force staff to safety here. But that last failed team fight, that was a pretty big net worth change for the Balkan Bears, and now it's a 5,000 gold and experience lead for M5, significantly less than it was just moments ago. And Nubik, well, he's getting very close to his Scotty, but until he has it, he's still just kind of uh, a Medusa with this mishmash of items that aren't giving him a huge amount of synergy. The value in Scotty isn't really recognized until you actually have it complete. Void is smoked right now, and they do not know it. He went for a solo purchase on smoke and a solo smoke, and he's about to get a massive chrono if they can just follow it up. Yep, Tron gets initiated on, but here we go. Haki goes in, but still, the ultimate from DP goes off. King R survives easily inside of the chrono, and now the rest of BBC on the defensive. They'll be headed for the hills as Weeha thinking about trying to reinitiate here, but not going to find the opening. Meanwhile, on the backside, Pedrino, he gets lassoed, stunned up, and the Centaur will be the first one to go down in this fight. And the rest of BBC have just been completely repelled. Roshan has respawned, and with that M5, we'll move into the pit and feel pretty damn safe about it, knowing that there isn't a Chrono, and there's a dead Centaur, meaning there is not a Stampede. But BBC will contest it at least a little as Fissure goes in, and that may be enough to repel them for now. Tron trying to finish off the ward on the high ground here. There's that RNG, baby. There you go. He'll finally be able to finish it off with that gem he's carrying around. Roshan going down very slowly. The Centaur will be back up soon. PGG going in onto the Lycan. He gets Yuled. And he does actually doesn't have an ultimate here. So triple cast run. Bloodlust onto Nubik. And they won't commit for this. Heart of Trask is now up on the DP, though, Blaze. That's a pretty well-timed heart, given that he's already picked up the Yules. I feel if they had gotten the Roshan there, the M5 would have just kind of sealed the deal in the game. Like, it's already out of control for BBC, and they don't really have a great foundation on the late game. Void's great, but Medusa's better. And, uh, yeah, in this position, that Void went for a very... I, I don't want to say all any gambit, but they just spent their last smoke for a solo smoke on Void. He purchases it, it's now on cooldown for 10 more minutes, and he tries to go for that massive chrono and only hit the DP. I think Dusa walked into it at the tail end, but that was not what they wanted out of that smoke. And yeah, they looks like they should secure the Roche as the Batrider's not close enough to get the clear vision on it. And uh, yeah, the Radiant see it, they just can't do anything about it. But I, I feel like that's the only thing that's gonna keep them in the game is getting this Aegis on Weeha and they have to make something out of it. Yeah, and even Weeha here, his farm a little bit lackluster. Okay, it's a little better than I thought. He's got the AC recipe and the chainmail on the courier. Thought he should have some more items than that, and we'll be about 500 off the completed AC. So going more of this aura-based lichen, uh, some good items in terms of knocking down towers with all that minus armor, but... Yeah, not the most rad Dota, and part of the problem with Lycan is, and, and Void on the same team, is Lycan just doesn't synergize with him. You get the Chrono down, and Lycan just basically has to stand there and wave at the enemies until the Chrono expires. Yeah, right now he's playing the role of Aura King. Right now he's carrying the Vlad, soon he'll be carrying the AC, and Padrino's going to be working his way towards a Crimson Guard. So with all those items intact, you have to consider how much damage the Medusa's really going to be doing with this split shot. Like, she's going to be a heavy hitter, but unless she looks towards a big item like the MKB or the Divine Rapier, you're going to see a lot of it nullified. There's already so much positive armor coming out from Weeha. Uh, the Crimson Guard hits does 50 for each split shot, and that's going to be a, a pretty big deal. So I think that they have to take that into consideration and uh, take their fights more carefully. Try to pick them apart rather than go in for the full force once all those items are online. At least for now, Newbie can just keep farming away, look towards the next big item post Scotty, and there's very little they can do to punish him. He's not going to die just from, like, three heroes ganking him. Yeah, now the two things on the side of the Radiant that help to make up for some of that difference is we'll hold that thought as Tron jumps onto Padrino. He'll use the Stampede, but... Lasso nullifies the full duration of it. In comes the Yules from DP, and now Tron will just try to make the escape. The rest of BBC starting to converge around this area. PGG caught inside of the Chrono. Mystic Flare will give him enough damage this time, and Ogre will fall to his death. So just a solo pick off there, but Chrono for an Ogre. Mm, maybe not yeah. the best, especially given that it's still level 2, so it is on that slightly longer cooldown. 
if they want to push off this Aegis, it probably isn't the best, because that support comes back fast enough, he's not the highest value kill, but the tier 2 is low enough that I think it might still give them that window of opening. Levi has the Blink Dagger, he's threatening with this Echo Slam. They don't want to rally too hard for this defense, but it looks like they're already here. Like, despite the fact, usually you see this position where like, oh, it's a 400 HP tower, it drops in 3 seconds anyway, so nobody bothers to defend. But eh, M5, they know how valuable their towers are, and they're going to look for the counter initiation onto Weeha here. Yeah, they'll uh, find him. He gets off the ultimate despite the Yules, there is no lasso for another 15 seconds. Nubix so. isolated. This is huge if they can get him, but they don't have the Chronosphere. Yep, and he's going to start laying in the auto attacks. Now King R comes in. The isolation has since expired. Stone Gaze has already been used. He's now silenced up the swap to get him back in a better position. Split shotting into the Ancients as they bring down the Centaur. Lycan has lost his ultimate, didn't find any kills with it. And end of that fight, it is just a dead Centaur, but it's not over yet. M5 want to continue pressing forward. Tron gets silenced, has a lasso, but now hit by the Fissure. In comes the dunk from Levi. It's a dead Bat Rider. The gem's been picked up, and now he gets multicast from PGG. RNG Jesus is with him today. The gem has been reclaimed by the Radiant side. I'm not sure who grabbed it, but they did snag it. Haki, he'll get left behind. He gets silenced. The Exorcism Ghost just laying into him. The gem is in the inventory of the Vengeful Spirit. So King R has been able to grab it, and now they'll move into this Tier 2 tower mid. Glyph comes out, but still a good bit of duration left on the Exorcism, and they will secure this tower kill quite easily. So it is M5 that come out hugely ahead on the back of that fight and regain a little bit of that lost footing. Yeah, so, I mean, in that position, they just needed something more. But they, if they had that chrono, like we were talking about, is it really worth it to get the chrono on the ogre? And I would say if this was 15 to 20 minutes in the game, sure, why not? Get some more gold for the void, use that chrono. Uh, but now it's in a position where you don't have it for that clutch play on the Medusa. Venge is getting more levels, so soon enough her swap is always going to be in range to pull somebody out. You just need to be extremely precise with this ability, and uh, precision was not on their side most recently. Now he will kind of make up for it with this most recent pick of the Aghanim Scepter. It's now only going to be a 60 second cooldown instead of a 90 second one, but ew, this is still dangerous territory for them as they are going for utility items on one of the few heroes that's actually going to have a chance of bringing the Medusa down. Yeah. I guess the shorter cooldown is helpful. I don't know. Oh, it is, but is it worth it is my question. Like 4200 gold deviating from so many other items. Yeah, I mean, that's like a crit well on your way to a Daedalus where you can just chop down that Dusa. Um, yeah, I, I think you make a good point. I'm also a little bit intrigued that the Lycan didn't get a Necro Book here because of just how good it is against Dusa. You've got that Mana Burn, and that does so much damage to her to cut through the Mana Shield, and it's also just really good on Lycan for the split pushing. Mm -hmm. I think the Aura items are a good idea, and I think they're strong against the DP and a good thought process, but a, in the context of a Medusa, you just got to value that Necro Book a little bit more. I definitely agree with that, but I think there's still time for that. Right now, we're 30 minutes into the game, and their pri priority in the team fight has to be bringing down the Death Prophet. If they go for this aura composition with Vlad's AC and Crimson Guard, they can actually just pl play to ignore the Medusa. The Medusa doesn't hit that hard right now. She's okay. very defensive, she's very tanky, uh, especially with the build of the Scotty and Talisman of Evasion, but she isn't killing people just yet. So right now, if you focus the Death Prophet down, you ignore the Medusa entirely, then you are better off to go this build. And then later on, Necro and Mana Burn strats can come into play when the Medusa is actually scary. Yeah, definitely. Well, Medusa picks up the value evasion piece there and actually will hold this bit as a fight could break out. We'll see Tron on the high ground. Perched up, looking for the lasso, finds it on Padrino, pulls him back into the team. They'll look to bring him down, but now Levi, looking for the dunk, takes a lot of damage. There's your chrono from Haki. Jumps on to Tron, but gets caught inside of the Yules. No Tratata outside of the Chrono, doing a lot of work. And now they'll start to turn this fight around as Nubik doing a lot of damage. Gets silenced by the Void and the Skywrath fall. Now Petrino and Weeha on the run. The Lycan will be able to survive thanks to his more than max movement speed, but it's a one for three. They've only lost their PGG, and those are acceptable losses as far as M5 are concerned. The Ghost mm -hmm. coming down. Will they have enough damage to bring down Weeha? The Yules, well, keeps him safe for now. Levi coming in with the dunk. Will buy some space for his friend. And that'll keep the Lycan alive, but now Levi, under the wrath of the Scotty, will get slowed up, and old Frosty will be able to bring him down. The Manta style gets picked up by Dusa as she stops by the enemy shop. Always got to hit that mall when you've got a lot of money, Blaze, and she'll spend it all in one place, and this time it'll be a smart choice as they move into the Tier 3 tower and BBC on the back foot. 
Yeah, you just have to let those lassos be those solo pickoffs. You have to realize that lasso into Stone Gaze is insurmountable. They almost got a second kill out of it, but some there was just so minimal focus, and there was a good defensive swap and made it impossible. And again, ogre for your entire team essentially. This is just not how they need to play the fights. Uh, try to avoid the lassos at all costs, but when they actually happen, you disengage. You don't fight that lasso. You don't have a chance unless you get like a four-man chrono. Yeah. And now we're at that, that point of the game where BBC are just really up against the ropes and you are mentioning that they can just ignore the Deusa thanks to all these items they've got to mitigate her damage, but I'm not so convinced that that's the case now. The Crimson Guard finally comes out, but now Deusa's got 17k net worth, has a Mantis style to go with the Scotty, and 2,000 gold towards the Butterfly where she already has the Talisman of Evasion, so another mm -hmm. 2,500 gold or so, and we're going to have a Butterfly. And I don't know that you can just straight ignore the Deusa at that point. Yeah, I, d I definitely agree with that general sentiment. I think the butterfly is when it comes to a tipping point where she has to be a target that you also consider. But we've talked about this before. Medusa is just a hero that you have to commit so many resources to to bring down. Uh, even a Shiva's heart, Yule's at Vigos cool. seems to be a better target. But Haki, with the Colonel, bro. fortunately he's got the Agonim to back it up, but we got an ultimate in turn. Yeah, you get the Bat Rider ulti coming in. Padrino trying to make some space for his pal. Connects with three on the hoof stomp, but Void triple cast from PGG. Nothing but skill, oh. baby. Flame break. That's going to fly over the head of Levy, but it's all right. They've got other stuns to lock him in place. It's a two for nil. Padrino just barely gets that blink dagger off as the auto attack from Tritata is inbound, but it's still a two for nil. They won't have a chrono for another 60 seconds. And M5, they'll look towards the base. No glyph for 30 seconds. This will do some crippling damage here, Blaze. Yeah, they just can't uh, fight them away from the base now. Without the Chronosphere, I mean, that's going to be back b before the Void is, unless he buys back, which he should. But uh, this Exorcism's still up and f for half duration. They just can't kill these people. And soon enough, they're just going to take the entire base here. They're going to make their last stand up on the top lane. But Weeha, what's he doing? He's mid lane. Is this like a, a base race one versus five? I don't even know. <laughs> Face race into the tier two tower while his team is getting jacked up in their uh, last lane of barracks are standing. Uh, it's I guess it's a noble effort. I'm not even sure that I can say that in good faith. It, it's an effort. The Back tier door two protection. has been a thorn in his side. He just wants the tier two. Can he get it before the GG call comes out? Battling backdoor protection. The fortify isn't used. Ooh. He will get the damn tier two. No! Oh. The tower stays standing. It's a morale slap in the face alongside a loss for the Balkan Bears. What an interesting game back and forth, but end of the day, the superior farming of Moscow 5 proves victorious. Dusa gets too big, and they just can't deal with all these big damage dealing heroes at the end of the day. Yeah, I won't call it a draft win, but it definitely was an advantage that Moscow 5 were able to really follow through with. Uh, PGG was very active in the early game, roaming about, and also taking a lot of the hatred, honestly. Like, he ate a lot of ultimates that forced BBC to, uh, to not fight for a couple minutes at a time, and every one of those timing winter, uh, windows is just a beautiful thing for Medusa to get off her feet. She didn't have to segue into anything but an Aquila and a Phase Boots, and which she was going to get anyways, and yeah, she just had a perfect game. So even though it's a stand-in that generally you have to look into how well do we coordinate, how well do we bring him into play here, he just gets free farm, 580. All they have to do is coordinate the lasso with the stone gaze, and that's going to be uh, a one game for them. So Moscow 5, they take another win, and they certainly needed it here in the Summit 2. Definitely. So we're going to have a break, guys, in our last game of the day. Power Rangers versus Team Tinker coming up next, scheduled to start in about 10 minutes. I'm um, Zyor, he's Blaze. Thanks for joining us for the Summit 2 Europe by G2A.com. Don't go anywhere, because we're coming right back.